war presents a lot of difficulties for the American system. One is that there is a real need for a joint government effort. That is, it is not something that just a president should do. It's something that the, ele the other elected branch, the Congress, should have some sort of say in, whether it be oversight, whether it be over the direction of policy, whether it be over funding, but it needs to be a joint effort. But at the same time, war is unpredictable. There are moments where there is military action that needs to be taken at a moment's notice. Congress is a deliberative body. It is a slow institution. Uh, of late, it is even slower than it's ever been. And as a result of that, there is a real necessity to have the president have the power to react at a moment's notice, to react in any way that he sees necessary to uh, uh, preserve the national defense and, and, and to ensure that America is safe. But at the same time, there needs to be some mechanism to rein in that power. A president can't just say, there's a conflict now, I have, I have the power to deal with it. And as a result of that, there are constitutional mechanisms uh, where Congress uh, can step in, but there are also legislative means uh, by which Congress can rein in the executive branch. And those legislative means came directly out of the circumstances around the Vietnam War. After the Vietnam War ended, Congress passed, over a presidential veto, the War Powers Act. What, this, what that piece of legislation did was it legitimized this idea. It, it really institutionalized the idea that presidents need to have the freedom to act in a moment's notice. So a hypothetical would be if a foreign nation launched a missile, a nuclear missile, at the United States, or any kind of missile. Or if American radar picked up uh, an air force trying to fly over the Atlantic Ocean toward the east coast of the United States, the president should be able to dispatch the American air force to, to fight. You can't wait for Congress to come back to town and hold a vote and hold a hearing uh, otherwise, we wouldn't have New York or Washington. Uh, so it, it institutionalized this idea of the need for a rapid response. But at the same time, it institutionalized congressional power in this area. And so what the War Powers Act sets up is a system by which a president acts, and as he acts, he notifies Congress within uh, a few days that he has taken action. That sets off a clock a period of time in which Congress needs to uh, continue to notify the, the Congress about the actions that are going on there. And Congress has the ability to vote down that conflict. They have the ability to pass a resolution of disapproval, which tells the president, you have to stop. And if he fails to stop, he would be in violation of law. And it is a means of preventing the president from gaining too much power, from wielding too much power. It's also a power that the Congress has never exercised since it was passed in the mid-1970s. But uh, nonetheless, it is one that is uh, remarkable in the sense that Congress actually took power back from the executive, something that rarely happens in the American system. And even though Congress has never exercised the, the ability to disapprove of a conflict, the idea is that because they have the power to do so, that informs presidential behavior. Presidents won't be as flippant with the use of force, they'll be more careful when they're engaging in conflict, and they'll be more willing to consider Congress's input as they prosecute a conflict. So while the War Powers Act was definitely an effort, it was more symbolic than it was powerful because ever since they passed the War Powers Act in 73, presidential compliance with the War Powers Act has been scant. Presidents see this as an infringement on their capacity to be commander in chief. And they simply, you know, they just sort of decide they're not gonna comply with it. Or they find caveats or loopholes or ways to say, well, it wasn't really, we weren't really sending troops, it was exploratory. There's different ways that they've gotten around it. So a congressional attempt to try to stymie the president's ability to send troops abroad has really not worked well at all. Formally declared wars were a mechanism that is prescribed constitutionally, and it was one that was relied on through most of the early republic. 
It has become outdated for a variety of reasons. One is that uh, conflicts tend to spring up quite quickly and, and in some cases out of nowhere, seemingly out of nowhere. The need, because of military technology, for a president to respond in a rapid way has increased dramatically. And as a result, that deliberative approach to war making has been seen as an outdated model. That said, uh, there are plenty of arguments, and, and legitimate arguments, that Congress has abdicated its power in this arena, that there are certainly situations in which the President should not have to operate under the War Powers Act, that Congress should be declaring war. A perfect example of this is in the aftermath of the September 11th terrorist attacks. There were actions that President Bush took immediately to secure the homeland. And some of those uh, would perhaps fall under the War Powers Act. But the actual invasion of Afghanistan did not begin until months later. Instead of declaring war, officially declaring war, Congress authorized the use of military force to the president to engage in certain operations. In many ways, this was effectively a declaration of war. It, it passed almost unanimously. Uh, but it wasn't a declaration of war. And so in some ways, this is a matter of rhetoric, a matter of language. There's really no effective difference. But the difference exists. We, we operate in a manner differently now than we did, say, in World War I. And in some ways, Congress feels that the use of the War Powers Act gives them more power, and others would criticize the Congress as saying that they should abide more by the Constitution th than they do. I remember meeting with my undergraduates at the University of Virginia on September 12, 2001, during a very narrow window of time where we were still meeting for classes. Later that afternoon, they decided to do away with classes for the rest of the week. And I remember getting on a bus and going over after September 11th and trying to figure out what am I going to talk with these students about 90 miles away as a crow flies from the Pentagon uh, where one of the planes uh, uh, crashed. What am I going to say to these students at this time? And I thought a few minutes and I figured, you know, the one thing that young people most need in a situation like this is some measure of certitude. What are some things that they know that they can count on? There's a great deal of uncertainty right now. And I went in and I told them that my social science tells me one thing, and that is that your political system is about to be turned upside down in a way that you can't even predict. And its ability to convey power to a president, an unlikely president, mind you, a president that had not shown a great deal of martial courage up until that point, or experience in foreign policy. Your government is about to be revolutionized in a way that you can't experience, and they're going to find ways to deal with this threat that we don't completely understand right now. I wasn't doing that because I was a partisan. I wasn't doing that because I was trying to make them feel good. Essentially, I was doing it because my social science taught me as a result of the experience of the Civil War in World War I and World War II, that this is the way the American people behave when it comes to crisis. We allow the president latitude to do the kinds of things that he feels that we need to do to get us through that moment of crisis. War defunding is meaningless. Uh, the ability of Congress to stop funding for anything exists, um, and that is certainly true of a military conflict as well. In practice, the politics of it are damning. If Congress were to defund a military, a military action, that would be seen as anti-troop. It would be seen as putting America's interests in danger. The actual manner in which you defund something would be a complicated process. You would have to provide the Pentagon sufficient funds to bring all American military personnel and military equipment home, but not too much funding that they could continue to prosecute the conflict is normal.